Sample Rate, Frequency Response, a Dynamic Range, Equivalent Input Noise, Impedance? You wonder what all these specifications mean and which specs to look at before buying an audio interface or audio recorder? Then stay tuned and I will shed some light on this topic. Hey, Julian Kras here and I will go through the common technical specifications you will find for an audio recording device and will explain what they mean and where they should be at. Ok, let's start with the sample rate. Common sample rates are 44.1, 48, 96 or 192 kHz. The sample rate tells you how many times a recording device looks at the audio signal and records its amplitude. So with a sample rate of 48 kHz, the recording device samples the audio signal 48,000 times a second. In audio recording devices, the sample rate usually defines the highest audio frequency it can record or play back, which will be half the sample rate. So for example with a sample rate of 48k, you can record frequencies up to about 24kHz. The human hearing ranges from about 20Hz to 20kHz. So even with 44.1 or 48k sample rates, you can record the whole audible range just fine. Still, on many devices you can go higher. A sample rate of 192k, for example, lets you record frequencies up to 96kHz, which is way beyond the human hearing range. This might still be useful if you want to record special effects and slow down a recording in post-production, because this way you will shift the higher frequencies down into the audible range. Manufacturers always state the maximum sample rate, and usually you can still record at a lower one if you want. So I think a recording device should at least have a sample rate of 44.1 or 48k. And higher sample rates are nice to have, but for the most part not strictly mandatory. Because we are already talking about frequencies, let me quickly slip in an explanation of frequency response. This is also a very typical spec you can find for an audio recording device, and in the datasheet the frequency response spec might say something like 20 to 20 kHz plus or minus 1 dB. What this tells you is which frequencies the recording device is able to record or play back. And because of that the frequency response for the input and output are usually stated individually. In my example the recording device can capture frequencies between 20 and 20 kHz. The plus or minus 1 dB states that the recording device might be a bit more sensitive to some frequencies than others. In this example, some frequencies can have a higher amplitude of up to 1 dB and some frequencies might be recorded about 1 dB lower than the average amplitude. This is a very loose spec and in the stated range you really do not know how exactly the audio recording device responds to different frequencies because you only get a range of maximum and minimum amplitude the frequencies can fluctuate in. A much better way of stating the frequency response is in a frequency response graph. Here all the frequencies are on the x-axis and the amplitude with which they are recorded on the y-axis. What you can see is a very typical frequency response graph. The frequency response is very flat and it falls off slightly at the extremes. Where exactly it falls off at the high frequencies is usually dictated by the sample rate, like I explained before. Sadly, nearly no manufacturer publishes the frequency response graph for their devices. That said, audio recording devices these days usually have a near perfect, meaning flat frequency response, in the audible range, which means that they will record all frequencies with an equal amplitude. Things are going to get a bit more interesting if you look at frequencies above the human hearing range, but then again this is more of a special use case. So overall the frequency response spec can give you a feeling of the frequency range the device is able to record or play back. And this should at least include the audible range from 20 to 20 kHz. Bit depth tells you how many bits are used for each sample the recording device takes of the audio signal. Typical values are 16 and 24 bit. More bits make it possible to record a higher dynamic range. And that's actually the spec we are going to look at next. With a 16-bit it is possible to achieve a dynamic range of around 96 dB and with 24 bits you can theoretically achieve a dynamic range of up to 144 decibels. Cheaper audio recorders or interfaces might only use 16 bits 
and even though this is not as dramatic as some people say it is, but still in my opinion 24-bit is the way to go for professional audio recording because you can achieve a higher dynamic range. The dynamic range of a recording device is the ratio between the loudest signal it can record and the device's noise floor. With a higher dynamic range you can leave yourself more headroom while recording without introducing any additional noise. The dynamic range is typically stated in dBA, that's decibels A weighted, and for the most part you want to have the highest amount of dynamic range as possible. A dynamic range below 100 dB for example is not that great, I mean you can still get it to work, but then you really have to be careful when setting your gain, and amplifying a recording in post-production or putting on effects like compression might reveal an audible noise floor. So a higher dynamic range can provide you with a some more leeway in post-production. A dynamic range of about 100 dB is fine for most cases and quite a lot of audio recording devices are around this value. Of course a something like 110 dB is even better and some devices even reach a dynamic range of 120 dB. This is pretty much as good as it gets in the real world and values like this you will usually only find on high-end gear. But generally speaking, if a recording device has a dynamic range of around 100 dBA or above, you will be fine. One more thing I want to mention is that the dynamic range is usually stated for the input and output separately. The output has its own dynamic range because it too has a maximum output level and a noise floor. And the dynamic range tells you the ratio between them. And for the output it is pretty much the same, anything above 100 dB should be plenty for most situations. Equivalent input noise, abbreviated with EIN, is a way of stating the preamplifier noise of a recording device. If you want to record very low electrical signals, like from microphones, you have to amplify them first, and that's done by the preamplifier in a recording device. Every preamp has some amount of intrinsic noise, which is added onto the signal it's amplifying. Of course, the noise a preamp adds to your signal should be as low as possible, and with the EIN you can easily check how much noise you can roughly expect when recording with dynamic microphones. That's why I think the EIN is one of the more important aspects of a recording device, and one more benefit is that as long as the EIN is measured in the same way, it is directly comparable between different devices. EIN is stated in dBU and the smaller the number, the lower the noise. But be careful, the numbers are always negative. So for example, minus 128 dBU is lower noise than minus 125 dBU. The beauty of EIN is that you can easily calculate the difference in noise between two devices by simply subtracting the two numbers. Here you can see that there is a 3 decibel difference in preamp noise between the two devices. Okay, back on track, what exactly does the EIN tell you and when does it make sense to look at it? Generally speaking, an EIN of minus 130 dBU A weighted is considered to be ultra low noise. If you have a recording device with an EIN like this, it is unlikely that you will experience any preamp noise in your recordings. An EIN of around minus 125 dBU is still decent and it enables you to get low noise recordings and many audio interfaces have an EIN around this value. Something like minus 120 dBU is a little worse and noise can start to seep into your recordings. Anything above that point, noise becomes more and more prevalent with higher EINs. One thing to add is that EIN is only really important when you record with dynamic microphones because these mics have a very low sensitivity and need a huge amount of amplification, and this will bring out the noise of the preamp. If you are recording with condenser microphones, EINs even up to minus 120 dBU are typically fine because you are limited by the noise performance of your microphone and the preamp noise becomes irrelevant. To understand THD plus N, you have to understand THD first, so let me explain that. THD is an abbreviation for total harmonic distortion and this is usually measured using a pure 1k sine wave and then the amplitude of the harmonics is observed. Harmonics are integer overtones which are introduced when a signal gets distorted. The sum of all of them in comparison to the original signal 
makes up the THD. And this is usually stated in percent for audio recording devices, but decibels is also possible. So a THD spec might say something like 0.001% at 1 kHz and minus 1 dBFS. This means that when you record a 1 kHz tone at a level of minus 1 dBFS, 0.001% of total harmonic distortion is introduced by the audio recorder. Now the N in THD plus N stands for noise, and as you may have guessed, the THD plus N spec combines the amount of total harmonic distortion and noise and states the amount they make up of the original signal in percent. The reason behind this is that both noise and distortion make up pretty much all the stuff that you don't want to have in your audio, so it makes sense to combine them. Of course, the lower the THD or THD plus N, the better because less distortion and noise is introduced. THD or THD plus N can also be stated for the output of the audio recording device and here it means pretty much the same. It is a measurement of how much distortion or distortion plus noise is introduced to your original audio signal. To be honest, for the normal user THD or THD plus N are not that critical because these days they are on a very low level anyways. It is debatable to which degree you can perceive distortion or noise, but I would argue that at a level of 0.00 something percent, it is not going to matter much. If you want to use the recording device to do technical measurements though, these specs might become more interesting. With gain, manufacturers specify the amount of amplification the preamplifier in a recording device can provide. And because you are usually able to change the gain, a specification might say something like 0 to 60 decibels. This means that when you turn the gain on the recording device all the way down, the preamplifier applies 0 decibels of gain, and on the contrary, if you turn the gain to the maximum, the preamp amplifies the incoming audio signal by 60 decibels. Instead of stating the gain which is applied by the preamp, it is also very common that a gain range is specified. A typical gain range might be something like 50 decibels. In comparison to the gain specification, this does not tell you how much gain is applied at the minimum or maximum gain setting, but much rather how big the range is you can control. So for example, a preamp could apply 10 decibels of gain at its minimum setting and 60 decibels at its maximum. Then the gain range would be 50 dB, because the range from 10 to 60 dB would span 50 decibels. So you have to be a bit careful when looking at these specifications. Gain and gain range are two different things, and on top of that they only tell you how much gain or gain range the preamp in the recording device provides, and they alone cannot tell you where your recorded digital signal is going to end up at. So only because the preamp in a recording device has more gain or a higher gain range than another device, it does not necessarily mean that it will record a stronger digital signal. If you want to know more about how to correctly compare gain of audio recording devices, I made a whole video on that topic, so feel free to check that out. Impedance is the resistance of a circuit to an alternating current, like an audio signal. Back in the day, a technique called impedance matching was used where the impedance of a mic was matched to that of the receiving device. This way the maximum amount of power is transferred. But these days we are fine with the maximum amount of voltage transferred and that's why a technique called impedance bridging is used nowadays. Here the impedance of the receiving device will be 10 or more times as much as the impedance of the device sending the audio signal. On audio recording devices you have to differentiate between the input and output impedance. The input impedance is usually stated individually for all the different inputs an audio recording device has. Because we are working with impedance bridging here, the impedance of the audio inputs is going to be relatively high. Like I said, the receiving device will have around 10 or more times as much impedance as the audio source. So microphone inputs are usually around 2 kilo ohms or above, line level inputs are around 10 kilo ohm, and instrument inputs usually have the highest impedance of around 1 mega ohm. These are some very rough numbers here. 
Of course, all the outputs on the recording device like line level outputs or headphone outputs also have an impedance and you already guessed it, that's the output impedance. Because a signals will be sent and we still use the impedance bridging technique, the impedance of the outputs is going to be pretty low. Line level outputs are going to be around a few hundred ohms and below and headphone outputs can have very low output impedances even down into the single digit range. So audio in and outputs will have all kinds of different impedances depending on what they are used for, but generally speaking the input impedance is relatively high, meaning a few kilo ohms and above, and output impedances on the other hand will be pretty low, so a few hundred ohms and below. Like the name suggests, this is the maximum signal a recording device can either record or put out, and this is typically stated in dBU. With the maximum input level specification, you can check that the recording device can handle the signal you want to record. Very often manufacturers separately state the maximum input level for different audio inputs on a device. For example, XLR inputs, which are often designed to be used as microphone inputs, have a lower maximum input level than the TRS line level inputs, which are designed to receive a much stronger line level signal. Problems can occur when you want to record a signal which is stronger than the maximum input level. In this case, you would have to somehow attenuate the signal before you are able to capture it without any distortion. That said, recording devices will typically have an appropriate maximum input level handling capability depending on the purpose of the input. Of course, all the outputs of a device have a maximum output level and that's the maximum signal strength an output can produce. Again, depending on the purpose of the output, it will have a different maximum output level. Phantom power, or sometimes denoted as plus 48V or P48, is used to power XLR condenser microphones. As plus 48V suggests, phantom power is 48 volts. Just for the sake of completeness, there are also 12 and 24 volt phantom power versions out there and some devices are even able to switch between them. But most microphones and recording devices these days use 48 volts. Even though most audio recording devices with XLR input offer phantom power, it might still be a good idea to check if it really does when you want to use condenser mics with this device. Quick side note, dynamic mics do not need phantom power. So these were quite a few specifications and now onto the big question, which specs are important to look at? In my opinion, the sample rate, bit depth, dynamic range and EIN make up the most important specifications. And maybe check if the recording device provides phantom power if you are planning on using XLR condenser microphones. Now this does not mean that all the other specifications are completely irrelevant, but if the recording device is designed properly, you shouldn't have to worry about them too much. One last thing I want to say is that you still have to be careful when looking at specifications and be even more careful when comparing specs between devices from different manufacturers. Because small changes in testing methodology or just different ways of stating a spec can lead to specifications which are not directly comparable anymore. That's why it is always a good idea to have a look at some reviews and see if the real world experience of people using the recording device match up with the manufacturer's claims. Okay, now you know which specs to look out for when shopping for a new audio recording device. If you have any more questions, leave a comment below and if you want, you can check out some of my audio gear reviews. I will see you all in the next one.